Well, the, the, the place that this um, uh, ordination season fits within the, the church calendar is, um, well, it's the end of a, a long journey for a number of people. Some have been exploring ordination for uh, many years, and then they've been uh, selected for training, and then they've gone and done two or even three years training, and now they're getting ordained as deacons, and then, then they've got a, a three-year curacy. Uh, so we, we don't rush into these things in discerning whether somebody's called to this role of leadership uh, as deacon or priest within the life of the church. It takes a considerable amount of time and therefore that sense of what an individual feels in themselves needs to be affirmed and confirmed by the wider church. And that we do not in a hurry but over a period of time in order to make the point that this is something that has really been thought through very carefully, been prayerfully considered because it's not for the faint-hearted. It's not, it's not an easy task or job. It's not an easy ride to be ordained. And, and to lead a, a Christian community. And so that's why we take the care, and that's why this ordination uh, weekend is so special and important as people are released into that role for uh, the future. So ordination is a beautiful moment um, for, for people as they step out to offer themselves in a fresh way, either to be a deacon or a priest. And um, there's a beautiful line where it says, you cannot do this in your own strength, but, so, but pray earnestly for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, my experience is that actually the presence of the Holy Spirit, um, filling people, refreshing them, equipping them for this next stage of their calling, is a beautiful moment to, to, to be part of. The ordinations are one of the most special weekends of the year in the Diocese of Blackburn and in any diocese. And for me, it's all about the stories. So we've got this wonderful group of women and men about to receive the gift of diaconal and priestly order. And each one has with them a remarkable story. They've come from all sorts of backgrounds. They've faced all sorts of challenges. But each one has beautifully and obediently responded to God's call in their lives. And those stories are precious because their stories are part of God's story, the way in which God is setting us free through Jesus Christ and the way in which he wants us as ordinary men and women to declare that message to others. So I'm a physiotherapist, um, I work part-time um, at Lancashire Teaching Hospitals and I also work part-time um, at St Cuthbert's Church as well um, as the curate there. So I have a role in both places. Um, so I see my role as um, sort of a bridge, um, being in the in-between space between the sort of the sacred and the secular um, and being Jesus within that place. Between um, last year being deaconed and, and now becoming a priest, the uh, challenges um, have been um, working within the NHS and ministering within a role within the NHS um, and obviously the, the NHS has been under immense strain um, because of the pandemic and that, that's continued and the staff have, have just continued to, to work relentlessly and being able to be there alongside them to actually offer the sort of pastoral and spiritual support to them as they continue to, to do the amazing job that they're doing. Um, it's been a challenge but a privilege, a privilege to be able to get alongside people, to listen to people, to pray with people in that context. I suppose fundamentally by loving people, praying for them and um, teaching them of the Lord Jesus by teaching the Bible. Um, that's how I would see the role of a deacon contributing to the health of the church. So becoming a priest this weekend is really humbling but it's really special and important. Um, there's two men that I see in my parish recently. They, um, the first time they saw me they were getting out of a taxi and they were like, what do we call you? We can't call you father. So I said, just call me Barbara. They went, no, 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 we'll have to call you mother. So now every time they see me they shout, hi mum, hi mum, and they see me quite a lot. Um, but what it means to me is um, being able to like, kind of mother spiritually. I think um, what happens is um, we tend to look after our bodies physically and our minds mentally, but the spiritual side we can kind of neglect. So I think it's a real big honour to be able to um, be able to help people care for the spiritual side of them. I'm looking forward to quite a lot of things in, uh, in my curacy. Um, particularly I've got a really great training incumbent who seems really intelligent, really bright and, and I trust to really kind of keep me on ta task. Um, but also uh, we're going to be working in a relatively deprived uh, or marginalised area, uh, which is really exciting because that's what I'm all about. Um, and also um, planting a church or, or seeing a church grow, um, which I'm really excited to see how that pans out and how that really happens. Well, it is my final weekend for ordinations here as the, the Diocese of Blackburn and as the Bishop of Blackburn. And I look back over the last uh, few years and think, 
goodness me, what an extraordinary privilege and honour it has been to have been asked and trusted to do this role. And this is to release uh, men and women into uh, authorised ministry within the Church of England as deacons and priests. And I haven't I've done a count-up, actually, to see how many it is on whom I have, for whom I have prayed. But uh, as I look back, that's just been a, an extraordinary uh, honour to be given as, as the Bishop of Blackburn in this role. Oh, it's, it's incredibly powerful and incredibly intimate, you know, partly because it's about touch. You hold the head of these people who've responded to God's call. And that holding of the head, that laying on of hands, stretches right back to Jesus himself, who laid his hands on the disciples, who laid their hands on the next generations of deacons and priests right up until today. It's an apostolic succession that you're passing on. And it's one of the most powerful moments for a bishop. And it's also deeply and incredibly moving because you know these people's stories and you know what they're offering to God and what they're being called to do. It's a, an immense privilege to be able to, um, God willing, on Saturday be ordained as a priest, to then be able to preside at the table, preside um, at the altar for people and ministering to people with the, with the Eucharist um, and sort of taking that forward into the, the workspace as well and sort of um, being, uh, in the Eucharist we say Jesus is here, this is, this is Jesus and that's what I'm doing as I go out into the workplace as well. So um, I've moved from um, Preston, from Blackpool to Preston um, in the last year. And uh, it's, although quite similar in context, are very different. So quite poor, very much multicultural um, in Preston, which is something I've not experienced before. So um, it's been quite interesting to be able to um, talk to different people of different faiths and to live alongside them as well. Um, which is a new experience for me. Before I had this um, pre-concept that um, you don't talk to people of other faiths about Jesus because you might offend them, but I found um, to be completely the opposite. So um, my neighbours are um, mainly Muslim and we hang out our washing together talking about um, different things in the Bible and um, we have a food market at church and lots of different faiths come there and we talk, we talk, as well as um, the ladies from the mosque um, join together once a month and we will um, discuss um, a, a prophet in the Quran and the Bible together so we will compare and contrast. So we've had some really interesting conversations um, yeah. across in different faiths. I mean, it's, in, it's so encouraging seeing how Vision 2026 is helping catalyse momentum. Um, across our parishes, our chaplaincies and our schools and, and how people want to see that continue through the vacancy. Um, my experience is often people who are newer in often have the best ideas or the, the sense of where the spirit's most moving and so to have a whole new set of um, workers in the harvest field is really good news. What prompted me to make the journey to become a deacon? I think lots of things. Um, I suppose a mixture of an internal sense of desire and um, yeah, a real wish to serve people in this way and also other people encouraging me to take that step ranging from friends and um, church leaders in the past and the whole BAT process. Uh, so I'd love to present it as a linear step-by-step -step thing. It's probably much more higgledy-piggledy and over many years that um, yeah, that's landed me here. So prior to moving to Preston, um, having to go through ordination training um, on Zoom, a lot of it, so missing out on a lot of residentials and being around people, um, I think um, it has made us look at things differently. So um, we now can um, think, how can we do this without meeting physically? So it does um, make you think more broadly. How can we um, worship together in different ways? And, so it has been interesting, yeah, but a lot of Zoom. So to tell you a bit of my story um, in terms of how I got here, um, when I was 18, 19, 19 years old, I um, had all sorts of problems. I was actually uh, taking quite a lot of drugs. Um, it all culminated at a point where I tried to uh, take my own life. Um, and then somebody um, after that invited me to church um, and I um, went to a church and somebody told me, for, for the first time I'd ever, ever really took it in, uh, somebody told me um, that God loves, God loves you. 
um, and it really shook me to the core of my being. And I knew after that I was going to give my life to, to serving God and God and his, uh, his people. The d diversity of the pool is, is extraordinary in terms of people from all sorts of different backgrounds coming through into, order, and that's a really healthy thing. If it was only just you know those who'd done you know a degree at a certain university would actually get through, which is what it was years and years and years and years and years ago. So that new diversity is a really healthy thing, and whether it's uh, you know whatever background that the, the can be a role within the life of the church, if that call is confirmed by, by the wider church. And so that diversity is a good thing and I welcome that and to have men and women, you know, that's been a special thing for me in these last nine years to be the first diocesan bishop to ordain women in the cathedral uh, as priests. Uh, my priest has ordained them as deacon, but actually I'm the first to ordain them uh, as priest. Uh, uh, and that's been very significant and very important. And so I want to be you know, affirming and supportive of women in ministry uh, within the life of the church, as well as those for whom that's a, a difficult issue. The mutual flourishing needs to go the other way as well for those for whom that's theologically a difficult issue. We've tried to make space for both positions within uh, the life of the church here in the Diocese of Blackburn. Well, I'm very excited that training is a lot more context-based. People are off on placement a lot more than they used to be. Um, and that, I think that really fires people's theology. And it also gives people more um, ideas in the tank for what it might mean to see turn around to grow a church, to renew a church, and to reach out to new people. So I'm, I'm really positive about the developments of training over the last 20 years. Um, I, th I think most immediately the challenges have been a year of... Um, settling into a new church family and taking part in the St Melitus course which has meant a trip to London each week and a, a bit of a move for us as a family and then another move to Blackburn but it's been a great joy as well and to have the time to study and think and talk to other um, deacons to be and to engage with the faculty and so on there have been lots of blessings in all the challenges. It was hard to study during the pandemic um, Partly because, it, as everyone did during the pandemic, it felt very, very isolating. And you didn't feel like you were really part of um, the community in the way that people maybe beforehand would have felt part of uh, communities as we were learning together. Um, the way I studied, though, um, being placement-based, did help a lot with that because I was uh, working essentially full-time in uh, one of the biggest housing estates in Sheffield, uh, running a food bank and uh, working on Christians Against Poverty in particular. Um, so there were different challenges that came through all that sort of side of stuff because of the pandemic as well. Um, we saw loads of people who had just been on the edge of poverty uh, shifting into the position where they do, did need to uh, collect food parcels. Um, and so lots of that I always describe working with marginalised people as sort of 90% pain and 10% the most beautiful thing you'll ever see in your life. And I think... Um, Yes, so for example, on one occasion, um, there was a, a man who was uh, borderline homeless and one of our helpers, I remember looking over and seeing that she was cleaning this man's uh, feet. Uh, his feet were gangrenous and she was wiping the, his, his feet down. And it was just this beautiful, something very biblical about the washing of feet, of course. Um, but there was also just, I think that, I think that, that image really does... Uh, capture that 90% pain, 10% beauty that comes from working with marginalised people. So there was all that sort of side to, uh, to the training as well, which was also difficult for a whole different set of reasons. Um, so as we really focus in this diocese, as I suppose others do, on really building good relationships with their ordinance, and we get to know them inside out. And we live th tra training can be extremely challenging, and we're with them through the hard bits of that and delighting in the, in the joys as well. And the first year in orders can be really difficult as well, as people learn new ways of praying and relating and so on. And that's part of the privilege, actually, to be holding hands in the tough times, but then to be there for them on days of rejoicing, such as the ordination. Uh, in, indeed, with the, 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 the crowd of people, people here that I've had the privilege of interviewing one by one as their pre-ordination interviews because I shall be ordaining at both services in the cathedral on Saturday and to have had time an hour or more with each of them individually in preparation for that so that I'm not a stranger to them and they're not a stranger to me so that moment will be actually a very personal moment of uh, ongoing relationship as I release them uh, with God's authority into the ministry of the Church of England in this diocese.